Okay, it's your turn. Let's get started. All righty. Well, this is an exciting day for us as this is our very first online market and I'm absolutely thrilled that we could be here for it. Ancient Arts has been around for a long time and it's really fun to move along and try new technologies and also to be able to see some of you all because we miss you. It's been over a year since we've been at a live event and this is no fun without being able to see the wonderful people that we're part of the community with. So um, a few little things to start off with. What we're going to do is have everyone keep their microphones on mute and we will have chat running and we have one of our lovely staff who are watching the chat and they'll make sure that I know about any questions that you have to ask or comments that you want to make. But if we have all the microphones off and on mute right now, then that means that you guys can, you know, talk or visit with your hubby, hi dear, that kind of thing. And we don't have to worry about sound cutting in and out and that sort of thing. So like I say, welcome everyone. One of the exciting things that I get to do with this presentation is tell you more about the company and about me and everyone who works here than we would necessarily get a chance to do in a booth. So one of the things that I get asked a lot by people who have a chance to chat with me are things like, who are you? Where did you come from? What's your background? What do you do? And all of that kind of stuff. So this is my chance to tell you who I am and who Ancient Arts is and what we're interested in. So my name is Caroline and I have been knitting now for more years than I really want to think about. It's over 50 years at this point in time, which kind of tells you how old I might be. And I've been a passionate knitter right since I started. So when I was four years old, I said to my mother, I must, must, must be able to knit and you are going to have to teach me. And she's like, you're four, are you crazy child? And I said, no, I'm not. So she sat me down with a pair of big yellow needles and some red yarn and I knit my first scarf and it was great. So I've had a passion for it ever since. And uh, sorry, I'm just being distracted by technology. There, now I can see the chat as well. Anyway, so I've had a passion for it ever since and I may have circled it in my career of various and sundry different things, including um, research scientist, statistician, accountant, and so on. But in the end, <laughs> yes, all the precious. In the end, I had to come back to my first passion, which is yarn and dyeing. So Ancient Arts was born out of a passion for color that I've had since I was four years old. And, sorry, brain froze. Not used to this technology. Please forgive me, everyone. <laughs> Showing my husband who's dancing anxiously at the side away. It was born out of that passion and it started off because of spinning. So I've been as well involved in the spinning community for many years now. I got my first spinning wheel all the way back in 1997, and I've done a lot of teaching of spinning and spindles and fibers and exotic fibers. And so one day I had a chance to buy something that was exceptional. And that chance came about with Bison Down. Now, anybody who knows me as a spinner knows I love exotic fibers and I love Bison Down, but it's super hard to find and it's super expensive. So there I was walking along at a fiber show and I met somebody who had a mill and she had a lot of Bison Down to buy and everything went black and I found myself coming home and I had a giant bag of Bison Down and it cost me $1,600. And this was back in 2008. And my husband, who I normally would discuss large purchases like this with, said, oh, what's this? And, and why did you buy it? And $1,600? And I said, yes. And spontaneously said, I'm starting a business. And thusly, Ancient Arts was born. Now, it's funny because I already had the name because I knew that I passionately wanted to have a business like this at some point in time. So I had the name. I had the bison down. And I mean, let's face it, spinning is something that humanity has been doing for anywhere between 30 to 100,000 years, depending on which archaeologist you listen to. So it kind of was a no brainer that it's an ancient art and that this would be a good name for it. So I started off by selling spindles and spinning fiber and lots and lots of bison down. Although you will be amused to know that original bag of $1,600 worth of bison down is still in my dragon's hoard of spinning fiber. Never did touch it. I've just been hoarding it and petting it occasionally. Anyway, that began it all. 
And the dyeing part of it, well, I've been dyeing things since I was about eight years old. And I started off with batik fabrics and weirdly enough, yarn and things like that, that had a lot of painting and, you know, really unusual different ways of doing things. So I could really experiment with how color was layered on. And I started playing with dyeing tops because when I was teaching things like spinning art yarns and the really elaborate things like the beehive and seashells yarns and so on, it was very hard to find the right dyed tops for it at the time. Nowadays, there's lots and lots of dyers and lots and lots of beautiful tops. And so it's much simpler. But I was dyeing these for my classes and people were like, oh, I must have them. I need them in my life. So I was dyeing them and then I would dye some extra and I would sell it to the class. And then one day I went, I've been spinning an awful lot of plain colored yarn because I love naturally colored fibers. I wonder what would happen if I dyed that. Ooh, it was so much fun. But the problem is then you have an awful lot of yarn and you can't possibly knit or weave it all in one lifetime. And then you think to yourself, I really don't like being an accountant. Perhaps I could sell some of this on the side to put some of that passion that I have into what I do for a living. And that's where ancient arts came from. So went to my first show at Old's Fiber Week, took 26 skeins of hand dyed yarn as a test. Poof, it was gone. It sold really well. And I went, hmm, interesting. And kept on dying. The year after that, my first major show and when I started wholesaling was Sock Summit down in Portland. And boy, was that ever an experience. 250 vendors and the mob outside the doors when it was about to open up, you could hear it, it was a roar. And things like the in the event, they had an evening knit in and there were 1600 people, like what an exciting thing to do. And this is where I really knew that I found where I wanted to spend the rest of my life. So I've got a lot of background with the arts and uh, you'll notice in a lot of the posts that I do in the colorways that I have that my mother figures in there. Well, she was an artist and she taught me watercolors and then this dyeing that I was doing as a child and all of the layered colors, that's come together to form the approach that I put into this. So what Ancient Arts does is we are, as we say, an artisan hand dye company and we draw our inspirations from nature, from art and our love of stories. So I take my life, I take the things that I love and I take the things that my wonderful staff love and they get put together into the yarns and the colors that we dye. So in regards to what we dye, our yarns are sometimes a little different from everybody else's because most of our yarn bases are custom made for us. And I'm gonna spend quite a bit of this presentation talking to you about that because I'm really excited about the fact that I could take all of those years of spinning and all of those years of knitting and put them together into developing our very own custom yarn bases. So we have two yarns that are not made specifically for us, but all the rest of them are, and that's really exciting to us. What's also exciting is that by doing this, by creating our own yarns, we can make sure that they're at our, what they have that are, our, we wanna put into these, both the fact that they are the best yarns that you can possibly get, but also some of what's important to us. So for example, what is important in life? Well, I think it's preserving the environment and making sure that we have an earth for our children and our children's children. This art that we perform here with knitting and weaving and crocheting, it connects us to our ancestors and it will connect us to all the people that come after us. And that means that this beautiful skein of yarn shouldn't be a skein of yarn that's going to pollute the earth and ruin it for the people who come after us because the people who came before us didn't wanna do that. It's the same thing here. So we make sure that our bases are ethically sourced. We don't want any sheep being mistreated. We wanna make sure that there's no mulesing in our yarns. And we want to make sure that the milling of the yarn is done as appropriately as possible. So we don't want bunches of chemicals dumped into the environment. And we don't want a whole bunch of things happening that would mean that those children that come after us don't have a good world to live on. So we use premium bases that are ethically sourced, ethically milled, and mostly spun just for us. That means that we can get exactly what we want as knitters and as dyers and as people who are thinking about those who come after us. So a lot of our yarns are actually really specifically designed with that in mind. So we will use yarns that are eco-friendly where they might be recouped fibers or they might be a fiber that is environmentally less stressful. So for example, using nettle instead of cotton, 
because metal is much easier on the planet to grow and process than cotton is. Cotton requires a lot of pesticides and herbicides, whereas nettle doesn't. It's a weed and it can grow in the ditches. It doesn't need any of that. So that's something that's really important to us. And I think it sets us apart from a lot of other hand dye companies in that we are privileged and lucky enough to be able to create the yarns that reflect our values. I just have to pardon me. I'm going to sip some water here. You will have to let me know if I'm talking too fast, everybody, okay? Because I have a bad habit of getting excited and speaking really quickly. <laughs> Heather reassured me that I'm only speaking at moderate pace, not insano, which is great. So I talked a little bit about my background, but what it is is what it is in, you know, like specifically is um, I was an accountant, so I have a lot of math involved in it. And that has been something that's been really great to translate into this business because it means that I can do repeatable colorways. And it means that I can plan to match things, you know. So for example, this gorgeous shawl behind me, which is called the Courage Shawl, the original knit by the designer was so beautiful and I loved the colors in it. And I'm like, hmm, what can I do about that? Well, math, from my accountant background and my statistician background allows me to be precise in that and then to replicate these things going forward. Another question that I get asked a lot, thank you about the enthusiasm, yay, I'm glad that that comes across well. Another question that I get asked a lot is, what are our inspirations? Where do our colorway names come from? Because a lot of people will connect with them, things like lichen in my crevices. So as a dyer, I and my wonderful staff like to put into this our lives. So stories about our lives and stories about things that interest us and so on. I don't know, can you tell me, is this showing? Because I don't think this is spotlighted. Okay, so somebody else would have to do that. I'm gonna pick it up and hold it out. Yay, yarn! This is our color of the month for January and it's called Be Happy. And be happy is something that comes from our lives. So the last year, it's been a challenge for all of us. It's been difficult and it's been sad and it's been angry and it's been distressing. And we wanted something in life that wouldn't be like that. We wanted something happy. And so we've created a colorway that reflects that story. This is coming out of the darkness, coming out of the hard places, the rocks, and going into the light and being happy. These themselves, to me, they're kind of a happy creature. They buzz around, they're very, very, um, they're like me a lot in that, you know, they're very regimented and oriented and, you know, they have, sorry? Yay! So everybody can see this? Okay. So right now I've got Yoriko as my main screen and I'm seeing myself as a small screen. <laughs> anyway, so Be Happy is a story in color. It is Wait, also tied but I think your, your camera has to be pointed somehow. Sorry? Your close-up camera is not pointed in the right way. I don't see you. Okay. Oh, you have to flip it, I guess. Woo! I can defeat technology. It only takes me 10 minutes. <laughs> Thanks, Yuriko. Okay, so having the second camera here is really helpful because then I can put these skeins here and you can have a nice resolution camera on them. So if Yoriko can spotlight me and this other camera, then we will be seeing the yarn and myself. Anyway, so every single colorway has a story behind it. So this colorway, for example, is Dear Little Buttercup. And it goes along with our color of the month and Dear Little Buttercup comes from all those cute little yellow flowers that you see in the Rocky Mountains when you go for a hike. And I've been hiking in the mountains since I was a little kid with my parents and my friends and my husband. And everywhere you go, you see all these different flowers and they're all yellow. And my mother obviously didn't wanna get into teaching us all the different names. And a lot of them are not really that exciting anyway, like toad flax. So she just called them buttercups. So Dear Little Buttercup is a cheerful yellow that celebrates going off and doing something fun and happy making and also celebrates mom and her weird little songs because, oh man, she would sing me some awful Dear Little Buttercup songs. So another kind of way that we have as an example here is Eiffel Tower. And Eiffel Tower celebrates all the colors that we were seeing when my husband and I went to Paris and we went to the Eiffel Tower. 
this was one of these bucket list kind of things that you only get one chance in a lifetime to see. And so this is my husband and I sitting by the cathedral in Paris, looking at the river, looking at the overcast skies, looking at the roofs of the building, and all of those are put into the colorway. So that's something that's really integral to all the colorways that we do. And if you ever are curious about the story behind one, I can always tell it to you because it's there. So another one here for the color of the month complement is this one, which is River Rock. And River Rock, the story behind that one is, when we got the house that we're in now, I wanted to do a xeriscape in the flower beds. So I didn't want to have domestic flowers or a lawn or something like that. I wanted to have a very natural landscape. So I couldn't resist building a little dry creek bed. And that meant that we would go and we would pick out rocks that would be appropriate for it. And I remember finding these amazing lentil shaped rocks that have these pale gray background with these dark speckles. And that's where this comes from is the joy of going and picking out these rocks and creating this dry rock stream bed in our backyard. And the purpose of the dry rock stream bed is that it helps to funnel water when it rains so that it doesn't end up on our business, business basement. And then the other thing that it does is that it provides cover for natural creatures. So I don't use any pesticides or herbicides in my yard, but we have a lot of aphids. So what do you want to encourage to deal with that? Ladybugs and spiders. And what do they need? They need places to hide in and take cover from bad weather and so on. So the dry rock bed actually provides cover for natural pest control. So that's in this colorway too, is beautiful rocks and again, making a nice home for creatures. Can you put the buttercup aside? Yes, I can put the buttercup aside. Can you slide it to the right? Sweet. So I am actually listening to our wonderful production assistant, Heather. She's also in charge of a lot of our social media, um, the, the beautiful photos that you'll see. She'll be creating social media posting materials. She does a lot of our marketing planning and so on. So she's helping me out today, but for social distancing so that we can do this in person together. Anyway. So are there any questions about things like the colorways and the stories involved? The colors are better when you hold it up due to the lighting. The lighting's a little bit dull. Yeah, we have so many lamps here and it's just weirder and weirder. How about that? Uh, no. no, okay. Well, I'll hold them up in future everybody and then I can set them down there. Uh, it's a little bit of a challenge because here in Calgary, the light is actually fading and it's getting dark outside. So we've tried to set up the lighting as best as possible, but with the sun going down, it got a little challenging. So I'll put them up in front of this camera. Here's River Rock, Be Happy and Dear Little Buttercup. Now, in terms of the types of dyeing that I like to do, I like to do a lot of different sorts of things. And we're not really a one trick pony the way that we can be, or some dyers prefer to be. Some dyers really like to get a style and they really like to dig into that style and just, you know, kind of really focus on it. But I like to do multiple different styles. So you can see with the colors from this month that we have speckle colors, but we also have tone on tone or semi solid colors. So I like to dye a lot of semi solid colors. I like to dye variegated colors, which are like this one. This is whales in the water. And you can see it's got bigger chunks of color. It's not little specks. So they're variegated. And I do like to do speckle dyeing as well. The tone on tones are fun because when you're trying to partner up a really wild speckle color like this one, Eiffel Tower, and you want something solid to put with it, it's important to be able to have that option. So we dye a full range of tone on tone colors and every single one of the speckle colors will always have a tone on tone or semi-solid or several of them that goes with it. So that's one of the things that I think is really interesting to know is that if you're ever in doubt about what you can pair up with one of our colors, just drop us a line because we'll be more than happy to help you. With more than happy to help you in mind, I am actually going to do the first bingo word because it ties in very much to what I've just been talking about. So for those of you who are doing bingo, our first word is inspiration. There's a question about please tell us the story of the lawn group, please. Please tell us the story of the lawn group. Uh, are you referring to Get Off My Lawn? Okay, the Get Off My Lawn series. 
So I have been really lucky to be able to work with a bunch of interesting people along the way. And one of them is my great good friend, Barb Brown. And Barb Brown is a really interesting lady and she has so much character and she's so pithy as well. So one day Barb was having trouble with something and I don't remember the exact thing it was. And she was having a lot of fun saying, get off my lawn, I'm old now and you just have to do what I say. And then we started giggling about how funny that was as a phrase. Oh, I know what it was. We were actually driving out to an event in British Columbia. And for Calgarians, this can be interesting in March and in October because you can get snowstorms. So we ended up, of course, in a blizzard. We were stuck in Golden for a day and a half. And Barb kept looking out the window and saying, get off my lawn, because there was a lot of snow falling onto the lawn outside our window. So this had to become a colorway because this was like, a thing that Barb and I did for years, going back and forth all across the mountains to do these events and inevitably getting caught in the snow. So Get Off My Lawn was a colorway that was, the snow is on your lawn and here's all of the various different shades of the grass and the kind of sad flowers peeking through it when you've got these snowfalls that you didn't expect. And inevitably it ended up having to be expanded into a fade series because, come on, stay off my lawn as the snow starts melting and oh my goodness, as the snow starts falling, you're on my lawn. And of course we've continued the series with things like at Christmas, we will have get off my lawn Rudolph because Rudolph's eating all your shrubberies. So that's the story behind the get off my lawn is Barb and her sense of humor and the snowfall on these mountain pass roads when we'd be going to events. And she's also asking how many colorways do you have? How many colors? Okay, I have actually lost track of how many colorways we have. It used to know to the number and I used to retire colors periodically so that we could keep the palette smaller, but it's turned out over the years that I have a hard time letting my precious babies go and I like to create new precious babies. So I'd say in the main color line, we have about 300 and then there's the last go color line, which is about 77, 78. And then there's all the limited edition colors of the month and so on. So somewhere between 300 to 500. Most of them though, main color line will be on the website. And if it's something that's limited edition or different, it's not there. But yeah, it's, it's sort of a number that fluctuates. Okay, so one of the other things that we do in terms of colors is we do cat and dog inspired yarn. Um, Heather, would you mind grabbing me a skein of something? So one of the things that we like to do with this is we like to give back to the community and the people who support us. And so we support various different charitable endeavors. And the first one that we started with was helping animal rescue. So I've been involved with animal rescue now since the year 2000. And then I was doing it privately on my own prior to that. But I worked with Meow Foundation and other organizations and I was a foster mom and a foster home coordinator and all of those sorts of things. And this involved an awful lot of work that was like, hmm, here, move 2,000 pounds of kitty litter and it'll be minus 27 and in the dark. And it got to the point where as I aged, my body said, not quite sure about that, dear. So I needed to find a new way that I could help with the cause of animal rescue that wasn't going to leave me having to move 2,000 pounds of kitty litter at minus 27 in the dark. Did that, didn't enjoy it. So we developed the cat and dog yarn and these are some of the colors here. This is tortoise shell. This is Australian shepherd. This is brindle dog. And this is Basset Hound. And we have a whole line of cat and dog inspired yarn. And what we do with these yarns is we donate a portion of the proceeds to animal rescue charities. So you can make something that will memorialize your favorite pets. They are wonderful neutrals if you're knitting, like if you're not a person who really wants to be wearing screaming yellow, there's a lot of really great neutrals in there. And then, like I say, there's this ability to support various different animal rescue groups. So donations that we do off of these lines are done both in Canada and the United States, depending on where the yarn is sold. So if it's sold to Canada or internationally, we donate to a charity here in Alberta. And if it's sold into the United States, we donate to Best Friends Animal, Animal Rescue. I always forget their name, which is embarrassing considering how many years we've been donating there. Anyway, so currently in Alberta, we've been supporting ARCS, which is Animal Rescue. 
Uh, and the reason what we chose ARCs is that they do both cats and dogs, and they also do more than just Calgary. So they go all over Alberta, but they'll also coordinate with organizations that are in British Columbia or Saskatchewan or even as far as Manitoba. So definitely a really interesting line of colors, and they are what actually put us onto the international stage. So back when I was doing Calico Cat, a giant blog called House Panther happened to pick it up. We actually do a tortoise shell. So this is a tortoise shell here. And sometimes I do paint it so it's darker. There are specific cats on each one of these that inspired the colors. So sometimes they don't necessarily match somebody's expectation of a colorway. So the tortoise shell is based on two cats, one of whom I owned named Perot, and another one that was a rescue, she was a rescue cat from the Humane Society, and another one that was named Coco Chanel from Meow Foundation. So anyway, um, House Panther picked this up and it went viral back in the day when viral was like huge and meaningful. So Calico Cat went everywhere. And my husband and I were on vacation and all of a sudden our phones and computers were going absolutely bonkers with notifications because we were selling thousands of skeins of Calico Cat all over the world because people thought this was so cool. It was a really great donation that we were able to make that year too, which is fantastic. But it brought us to the attention of people like Vogue Knitting and other international organizations, which was so cool. So we've done a lot of work with Animal Rescue through these colors and it also helped as a dye company because it sort of set us aside from some of the other companies at the time who were doing a lot of beautiful work, but okay, how do you tell us all apart sometimes? So anyway, these are near and dear to our heart and we are actually going to be bringing some new colors out this year because it has been a couple of years since I have added to the cat and dog line and I think I really should. After all, there are more cute kitties out there than just the colors that we do. The dog line is a little different in that I don't name it as much as possible after specific breeds because so many breeds of dogs are so similar to each other in color. So for example, a St. Bernard is really very similar to a Beagle who is really similar to a tri-colored Collie. So we try with those ones to name them more by the color itself, but cats are a little different because you'll get a lot where they're just named by the color of the coat anyway. Okay. So that's a little bit about our yarn and our colors and our inspiration. So let's talk a little bit about our bases. So one of the things that I wanted to talk about in regards to base yarns is things like, how do we evaluate it? How do you know if a yarn is soft or not soft? And I thought a really cool thing that I could do for everybody was to explain some of the jargon that you will find in the industry. One of the things that can tell you right away how soft a yarn or a fiber is, is a thing called micron count. And a micron count is a way to measure how thick or thin a fiber is. So when you're looking at something that's really soft and really fine, a lot of people will have come to mind something like Kiviat or cashmere. And a micron count for those is usually on average between 15 to 19. Bison down, that wonderful, wonderful substance that actually started my company is so fine that it's actually 14 microns. So it's even finer than cashmere. Merino wool, which so many of us love and so much yarn is made out of, averages between 18 to 24 microns, although you will find some now that's as fine as 13.5. And that's absolutely amazing. So 13.5 little units of measure. And that's amazing because it's finer than cashmere. And that to me is just mind boggling that people have bred sheep to have wool that fine. Micron count is really important because if a fiber is really, really fine, it's really, really soft, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's strong. So it's kind of like hair where I have really fine hair and I get, you know, my little split ends constantly, but my sister who has much be more beautiful hair than I has much coarser hair. And so she doesn't have anywhere near the problem. Her hair is thicker than mine, so it's stronger. And it's the same thing with wool. So when you want to buy something that you're going to make into a baby garment, you might want to buy something with a finer micron count. But most labels don't say anything about micron count. So this is one of our standard labels, and you don't see anything on there about micron count. There are words that will tell you what the micron count on something is. So an ultra fine merino, if you see that on a label, the words ultra fine merino, 
that will tell you that it's less than 17.5 microns. That tells you that it's as fine as cashmere and it's insanely soft and this is a perfect thing to make into something that you're going to put your baby in occasionally but that you don't want to put in the washing machine or it would make a fantastic cowl or a next to the skin item. If you have something that is, says super fine merino, now you're looking at something that's around 18.5 microns. Superfine merino is also crazy soft and has beautiful drape and is really luxurious. And if you're making socks, no, don't buy superfine merino because your socks will wear out in no time flat. Extra fine merino is 18.5 to 19.5 microns. And extra fine merino is still super decadent, but now you're getting into something that you could make into a sweater because it's not so incredibly frail that it's just going to disintegrate or filth. Then you get up into the slightly coarser, and that is 19.5 to 20.5, and that is a fine merino. And then you get into what's actually a coarse merino, and that's just called merino. So if a label only says merino, then you're looking at 20.5 to 22.5 microns. So this seems all a little mathematical and a little bit confusing, but suffice it to say, what they're doing with terminology on labels is that the more that the label gets excited about the merino, the softer and finer the fiber will be. So you can just look at the name on a label and know whether it's going to be super soft or not by how it's worded. So a yarn that says merino wool is not that soft. A yarn that says super fine merino is really soft. And when you go to design your yarns the way that we do, this is really important because what we'll do is we'll choose the wool to match the purpose that we want that yarn to be used for. So for example, if we wanted to make a yarn that's only going to be used for like shawls and soft cowls and your like extra special sweater, that's where we'll choose a merino that's an extra fine or a super fine. If we want a soft yarn, then we'll choose a fine merino or just a plain merino because those wools are coarser and so they're stronger. They're not going to break and shatter and wear out as easily. So Socknado, which is one of our custom yarns, is made out of fine merino. And I chose fine merino, which is 19.5 to 20.5, because you would be able to make socks or sweaters out of this yarn, but it wouldn't be scratchy the way that some are. So it's a happy balance where it gives you plenty of durability, but it's still got lots and lots of squish factor to it. Yeah. So Socknado is really great for all sorts of things like shawls and sweaters and socks, and it has wonderful drape and elasticity. A finer merino gives you lots and lots of drape. So you can see that this beautiful shawl, which is called Clownfish Fantasy by Maria Price de Soto, has a lot of movement and life to it. Another wonderful option is something like Castapinka's Hugshot Shawl, and you can see again, there's lots of movement, but the yarn is also strong enough to give this shawl some body. It keeps its shape, it doesn't collapse in on itself. It's also good for great big powerful shawls like, holy smokes, did I ever not realize what I was getting into when I knit this, but this bad boy is Speckle and Pop by Stephen West, and it is a great big shawl. Massive. I, of course, had to knit the extra large size, and I think it would take two of us and a wider camera than we have to be able to show it to you. So choosing a wool that is a fine merino or a merino for a big shawl like this means that it still has enough structure to be able to show off this wonderful shape. If this was a super fine, it would collapse in on itself a little bit more and you'd see less of those wonderful shapes. And let me hold it up closer because you see how you've got this amazing, the holes and the shaping and all of that. So Socknado is a great choice for a shawl like that because like I say, it has the body, but it also has the softness. So another yarn that we have that is custom designed for us is our yarn called Merino DK slash light worsted. So it's not a very exciting name. It's not like Socknado, which was inspired by Sharknado and tornadoes of yarn. And who doesn't want to experience a tornado of yarn? Merino DK slash light worsted. This is a yarn that we've had since the start. And there was a fad for naming yarns for a while just by their fiber content and weight. So 
this tells you that this was a yarn that I had created for us quite early on in the history of the company because it doesn't have a cute name. When people started naming yarns with cute names again, I was like, Yaman, yeah, because now we could have something fun. So these beauties are made out of an extra fine merino again, because it gives you a lot of softness and squish factor, but it also gives you the structure that you need in order to have a good garment. If you can pass me the sweaters. No, right in front of my face. So this beautiful sweater is the Deep Sea Abyss cardigan. And this is made with Merino DK and you can see that it's got excellent stitch definition and it takes beautiful rich color. And we've been wearing this sweater now, oh, I'd say three years and it looks like it's brand new. So it's in wonderful condition. And that again is thanks to choosing the right wool for this particular yarn base. This poncho is the Wayward Wind Poncho by Julie Turgeman, and it is fantastic. So it's a beautiful big poncho with mosaic and a nice ribbed collar. And again, this poncho has been worn extensively by staff, by me. It's gone to knitting stores and it's been on display and it is in, again, really good condition because we have used the right Rikon Merino for this to be soft and drapey, but stand up to wear as well. So here's the label off of that. Now, why DK slash light worsted? Well, there's really interesting trends in the knitting industry and in the knitting world. And at one point in time, DK was the thing. It was the most favorite yarn. And so a lot of companies had a DK. And then worsted hit and worsted was the yarn and all of a sudden where the classification moves from DK to worsted shifted. So when I first had this yarn made a 220 meter per 100 gram skein of yarn was considered a DK and then all of a sudden it was considered a true worsted. So what was I going to do? The problem was is that this yarn had shown up in enough magazines and designs, we couldn't drop the name because then no one would know how to get the yarn for them. So I put light worsted on the end of it because technically it is actually a light worsted. The great thing about Merino though, is because it's squishy, you can actually work with this yarn in a DK pattern and it'll compress down, or you can work with this yarn in a worsted pattern and it fluffs to fill. So it's actually a really flexible yarn because it allows you to knit quite a wide range of gauges. So I talked earlier about some of our eco-friendly yarns and our eco-sensitive yarns. And one of them that I am really, really proud of is our nettle yarns, nettle-based yarns. So these are little nettle soft, and it is a blend of fine merino and actual nettle plants. And we're talking the stinging nettles that you get in the ditch. Why stinging nettles? Well, there's a history of at least 2000 years of actually processing these plants to remove the fibers that grow in the core of the plant. They're just like linen. So it's just like flax and linen and it can be extracted and it makes beautiful, beautiful yarn. It's soft and it's incredibly lustrous. And like I mentioned earlier in the presentation, the neat thing about this fiber is that it's completely environmentally friendly. So when you grow it, it's sustainable. It doesn't take away from the soil. It doesn't require a bunch of additional water and it's not as difficult to process as flax. Flax, there's a lot of wastewater off of it. Nettle has less waste. So that means that again, it's more environmentally friendly. And as a knitter and a person who wants to wear something, it looks like silk. Like look at the shine on that. It shines as if it was silk, but it's not. So it's not as expensive as silk, which means that the yarn stays a little bit more friendly in terms of price point. But another neat thing about it is that it's also hypoallergenic. So it doesn't get a lot of bacteria buildup. So if you were making something and you were a person who tended to sweat heavily, or you lived in a really humid climate, this would be a great yarn because it's not going to build up a bunch of bacterial odors. It actually will help you to maintain your garments with less washing. The other thing it does is it breathes really well. So if you are somebody who has their own personal climate zone, as some of us do, this is the yarn for you because you go into a hot room 
and it breathes and it keeps you at a comfortable temperature. You go into a cold room and it's still insulating, so you stay warm. And I found it really fascinating to go to a VK live event where the temperatures were wildly varying from classroom to classroom and be able to just wear the same sweater the whole day without having to worry about it. So we're really proud of this yarn because it brings the best of an eco-sensitive plant to a really beautiful yarn. This yarn gives you wonderful stitch definition. So in this sweater here, and let me just grab the name of it because for some reason I always forget, it's called the Acetique Pullover by Adrian Larson. Look at the beautiful yoke in this sweater. I'm hoping that you can see it. It's got fabulous cables and then beautiful, beautiful stitch definition. So this is a wonderful sweater yarn because it's got drape and it shimmers just as if it had silk in it and it breathes so well. Like in here, I'm sitting here with a bunch of lights and I'm kind of too hot, but this sweater in my hands feels nice and cool. So it's a beautiful thing to wear. It also, because of the nettle in it, has really, really great blocking tendencies. So this is the Winter Lake stole that I designed for Vogue knitting and it was in the winter 2018 issue. And you can see how well the lace patterns have blocked in this yarn. Now I've been wearing this stole extensively for oh about a year and a half and yet the blocking in it is as good as the day that I made it. That's actually kind of a fun thing that because I was incredibly honored by the Vogue knitting editors and Trisha Malcolm in particular she came to me and she said you're a good designer and you have a really neat yarn and go for it design us a thing. And I'm like, oh my God, well, I love wearing stoles and I love doing lace weight and she wanted a fade. So I ended up designing five different fades just for this stole, including the gray to pink fade that is in the original. This is the painter's Siri fade, which is in blues. And you can see it goes from a lighter blue to a darker blue all the way along. We did a fade in purples with the orchids because I'm kind of orchid obsessed and get off your lawn. The whole reason why that now has a whole series of colors is again this. So that was a lot of fun. So Nettle Soft is a really great yarn for sweaters and we sell a lot of the DK because again, it works really beautifully. This is the Pyramids Cardigan by Julie Turgeman. And you can see again, it has some really nice stitch definition in this. It's a beautiful, simple cardigan, really nice to wear, great structure. And the yarn makes it look absolutely gorgeous. It just gives it that shimmering effect again. How many plies? The little nettle soft has three plies, soft nato has three plies, and the nettle DK has three plies. And that's actually a great question. If a yarn has two plies, it's really great for lace. It's going to open out and it's going to give you fabulous lace definition. It's going to block really nicely for lace as well. A three ply is rounder and will give you great stitch definition in a sweater, but it allows you to do cables better than a two ply. So when we designed these yarns, I had both versions of the nettle yarn done as three plies because I knew there was going to be more than lace that we wanted to make with it. A four ply shows lace less well than does a three ply. So three ply was a great combination between something that would make really good lace, but something that would make good cables. Now I'm going to pause and I'm going to give you your second bingo number here or bingo word rather. And your second bingo word is pearl. And I love to pearl with nettle DK. <laughs> that brings us to our next yarn base, which is custom done for us. And I'm very excited about that one because it is a reclaimed fibers yarn. So this yarn is one that is made from fiber that would be lost in the landfill, if not for being made into this yarn. In industrial mills, the machines are massive. They're the size of a locomotive. And if you want an idea of what they look like, old ones that are not as big as the main ones, have a look at the online tour that you can do with custom woolen mills. They sell really gorgeous yarn, but they also have all of these fabulous pictures of things like carters and spinning equipment. When you run these big carters, there's an awful lot of fiber that's on them. And when you're finished running the fiber, having it combed out and smoothed and ready to be made into yarn, there's massive amounts of it left on the machines that have to be cleaned off. Normally that fiber goes in the landfill. There's nothing they can do with it because it will be a mishmash of whatever was on the machine. And the next time that you run something on the machine, if it's a different fiber, 
then how would you mix that with what was on there before? You can't, so they come up, they take it off. The thing is, is that the amount of fiber that comes off these machines is astonishing. So when I talked to the mill about getting me some sort of recouped, reclaimed, recycled yarn fiber blend, they said, well, what about that? And I said, yeah. So they said, well, let us save some up for you. And they came back a couple of months later and they had a hundred thousand pounds of it. I kid you not a hundred thousand pounds of fiber that would have all been thrown away brand new fiber never any, had anything done to it and it would have been put in the trash so what a tragedy that is that is not environmentally friendly you think about all the things that go into producing that fiber and then it's just going to end up in the garbage that's no good we need to conserve instead of putting more resources out there growing more sheep taking more feed having to do more pasture, taking away from more wild spaces, why not make better use of what we've got? So we had a lot of fun with these people at the mill and we had some yarns designed for us out of this blend. So the first one is Revival Fingering and it is a four ply high twist fingering yarn. So there's a nice close up of it. And the reason why it's high twist four ply is that this one is a blend of mohair nylon, wool, acrylic, and silk. And each time they save up the fiber for me, this blend changes. It's whatever's been on the machines that they've collected for me. But this blend spoke to me and it said, I am strong and I am vividly colored. And this would be a great sock yarn in my opinion. Or if you wanted something like a sweater that's gonna be really hard wearing, you'd want a high twist yarn with lots of twist in it to protect the fibers to keep them from pilling out. And you would also want that tighter ply structure so that it's less likely to wear. So revival fingering is meant for those really strong sorts of garments that you want. A shawl that you're gonna put with your winter coat and wear every single day, day in, day out. And yes, your cats are gonna come and snag it. That's the yarn for you. So as an example of it, some of the viewers here will be familiar with it, but this is the Monument Valley stole or shawl rather. And it takes great stitch definition. So I'll hold it up close so you can see. It blocks out incredibly well because of its fiber content. And the mohair that's in it means that it's wonderful for stranded work because it beds together beautifully. Like look at how nice and even the floats are. This shawl I have been wearing now for two years and I wear it constantly and it rolls around in the middle of the production area and the cat slipes on it and the cat cavorts with it. And one of them has stolen it several times and made off with it. But because of the blend of fibers in there and the way that it's spun, it has lasted beautifully. So if you want a really hard wearing yarn, choose the Revival. The worsted version is not as tightly spun. You can see there what it looks like. It's just as vivid and jewel tone, but it is a three ply with a softer twist. And the purpose for this yarn, in my opinion, is more like sweaters and big rich drapey shawls. So this is a beautiful example of a shawl knit in this. And you can see again, it's got great stitch definition. Let me get the right side out there. Great stitch definition. And it's got drape to it. But because it's not a tight four ply, it does give you more of a lacy look. It still gives you good cables. So here's a wonderful example of a cable sweater done in that yarn. And you can see that there's a lot of beautiful cables in there with decent definition. So the interesting thing about this one is that currently the content on this one is slightly different from the previous batch of Revival. So the fingering version has, oh, no, it's a different label. Sorry, we've got an old skein here. Anyway, there's a different proportion of wool and mohair in this, and there is a little teeny tiny bit of acrylic as well and some silk. So each batch has varied a little bit in terms of the proportions. So the worsted version is slightly different in proportion from the fingering version because they were spun from different batches of fiber. The next base that we have that's custom is Lascaux. And Lascaux is such an interesting one. That's the one on the big shawl here behind. And that's done from different breeds of sheep. So this is heritage sheep's wool. The Manx Lachlan, and yes, you say it Lachlan, not Loten, so you can see how it's spelled there on the label. It's not actually pronounced that way. It's pronounced Lachlan, and I actually found out about this because the mill people were saying Loten and 
I had the great fortune in a class to be sitting next to a lady from the Isle of Man where Manx Lachlan sheep come from. They are a rare breed sheep. And she said, no, 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 my dear. It's not pronounced Lotan, it's Lachlan. And how cool that you're using it because that is an amazing sheep. And it is. It is a caramel colored sheep and they have four to six horns. The boys are hilarious because they actually stand there and instead of fighting with those horns, they show them off. They pose and they primp and make themselves beautiful. And then they decide who is the best looking sheep. And that's the guy who's the dominant ram. It's combined with a wolf from South America called a Punta Arenas. And a Punta Arenas is descended from Corydell sheep. So this yarn gives you something that's really springy, which is the Manx Lachlan, and something that's long and lustrous and drapey, which is the Corydell alias Punta Arenas. And what it gives you in the end is a yarn that's got a lot of bounce and fluff and loft to it. And it's rustic in handle and it is amazing for color work and for sweaters and things like that. So how much time do we have left, Heather? Okay, great. The Manx Lachlan blend wool is not as fine as Merino. This is actually a wool that rates between 25 to 27 microns. And you'd think that would be really scratchy. But the great thing about some of the breeds of sheep out there is that micron count isn't necessarily equal to how it feels. A 27 micron count Merino would be like sandpaper, but these heritage breeds of sheep, not at all. This is actually next to the skin soft and it is a wonderful yarn to knit with. I chose these two because it's old world meets new world. And because one of them is naturally colored and look at the rich colors that you get on this yarn. Dying with this yarn is just a joy because this is washing out a little bit on the camera it looks like, but the colors are rich and earth toned and they look like they were nature dyed because of that natural brown underneath the yarn. It's wonderful to knit with. The fingering weight yarn comes in 100 gram and 50 gram skeins and it is fantastic for color work. Uh, can I have the color work towel in the find? It's blue. So this is the zoological hat and you can see how completely perfectly even it is. Yes, this yarn is really exciting to me because it makes color work super easy. So this is stranded color work. This is by Caitlin Hunter and Heather will put the pattern names in the chat for you. But this is the very first fingering weight thing that I ever worked as a stranded color work pattern and you'd think I knew what I was doing. So that's the inside. So having a yarn that's a two ply makes stranded color work so much easier because it beds together. It meshes to itself and it behaves marvelously. This is, let me just check the name of this sweater because I knit a whole bunch of these because I love them so much. This is Hinterland by Jennifer Steingas. And this yarn is absolutely perfect for these beautiful color work yoke sweaters. So if you're looking for something to make stranded color work of any type, whether it's mosaic, stranding, you name it, easy to work, Lasco is your friend because it will be super easy to do. So I've knit all of this stranded color work stuff. And even though I've been knitting for 50 years, I've only been doing this for a couple of years. And it just, the blends of the sheep wool themselves and the way that the yarn is structured makes it so easy to work on. So really a joy to be doing that. We have coming out soon, Alasco DK, but the other one that we've been doing a lot with is our Lasco Worsted. So this is my very first stranded color work project ever, and I'm so proud of it. This is the Willow Work Cowl. And again, the rustic nature of the wool in this yarn made this really easy to work. It beds into itself, it makes a great sweater, and it's very comfortable to wear. The nice thing about it is that the yarn is comfortable against your skin. So that's something that was really important to me when I was creating another heritage breed yarn was having something that's comfortable because I'm a big fan of things like the Briggs and Little. I love that yarn, but you don't wear that yarn against your skin. This one you can. I'm also a big fan of um, yarns like the Brooklyn Tweed, but those are woolen spun yarns. And that's a little bit challenging because a woolen spun yarn is very soft and fragile and can break. So the first sweater I knit out of Brooklyn Tweed Shelter, I ended up snagging it within a couple of days. And that was kind of heartbreaking because I didn't really want to have a hole in my brand new sweater that took me months to knit. 
So this yarn is strong and won't snag and tear that way that one will, but it still has that loft and that rustic beauty that those yarns have. It's wonderful too as a three ply because you can do things like mosaic color work. This is the Tesserae jacket by Melissa Leitman, and you can see that it just sits really nicely in the work. Mosaic is a great option when you are trying to decide whether or not color work is for you because you're only using one color per row. So this is a great option for you because you're using one color per row and you're using a yarn that's going to make your knitting easy. So this is another mosaic piece. And you can see that it has beautiful, rich effects and you can see the color on this yarn is absolutely gorgeous too. Okay, so I noticed that a few people are having to drop out. So what I should do is give you a code. We have a code for a discount on our website that's good for four days. Oh, there it is. And here's the code. It's 15 fiber love. So anything that you buy on our website will be 15% off. And the other thing that we need to do is a giveaway. This is very exciting. So Heather, I need you to randomly select somebody who is present as a participant and let us know who it is. And we are going to be sending you a set of our fabulous color of the month, Be Happy. Because we want to give back to the people who have supported the Fiber Love event. And we want to thank Eureka by making sure that people remember it as long as possible because she has worked so hard on this wonderful event. So. <laughs> Hi, Eureka. <laughs> and it makes me happy to do a giveaway too, because this is really embarrassing to admit, but I missed my own 10th anniversary. So our business has been around for 10 years and I didn't notice. I was having so much fun with gnomes that suddenly four months after I went, oh my God, we've been around for 10 years and we forgot. So we're going to have to make our 10th anniversary be the first time I did a giant show. So that'll be this coming year. But in the meantime, somebody will get a lovely set of bees. Exactly. We can still celebrate. So Heather, who is our lucky winner? Gabby Mann. Gabby Mann. So Heather has used a random number generator. And Gabby Mann, if you can email us at info at ancientartsfiber.com, we will be more than happy to arrange to ship your prize to you. Oh my goodness, Gabby, that's wonderful. Don't want yellow, we can change it. Ah, <laughs> uh, it's beautiful. Excellent. Well, there's enough here to do like your average sweater or a really great shawl. Stephen West has some really fun um, hyper knit options. So I think that we'll be able to find you a good pattern to go with it. Okay. How Delighted. Thank you so much. Three minutes. Well, I have pretty much covered everything that I wanted to say. Are there any other questions that people want to ask? This was super informative. I'm so glad you found it that. It was a lot of fun to do this. We will definitely show the code again. Here is the code for the discount 15 fiber love. And for anybody who missed the bingo words, inspiration and pearl as in to knit and purl. Yep. So Heather is just catching up on giving you some links and information on sweaters. Anything that you would like to ask more about, please do feel free to contact us. Oh, and I totally forgot to tell you, we have sock NATO twisters, mini skeins. So anybody who didn't, uh, see the sock NATO earlier. Look at it rocking in this beautiful sock. This is the chocolate cherry parfait sock and we do have this pattern available for those who like minis. Passion 8. Well, Tanya, I wanted to talk about Passion 8, but the problem is, is that we have so many yarn bases, I had to narrow it down to just a few. So in the next one of these that we do, I will be more than happy to talk about Passion 8. Passion 8 is a lovely merino nylon blend that is actually from a Canadian mill. Thank you, Kim. It's always a pleasure to do these. You know, I've had so much fun sitting in on some of the other presentations because 
you do, you learn so much from everybody in the community. And, you know, I've been knitting for 50 plus years and that doesn't matter. I'm still learning something every day, which is so wonderful about this craft. Thank you so much, Charlie. And thank you, yes, to Heather, who has been in the background making this work. Yes, we can arrange FaceTime. Isn't it? Yes, I agree, Gabby. It is the best part of this craft. It's the connections that we make. All right, everybody. Well, I think that we're getting to the end of our time. So I'm going to thank you all for spending an hour with Ancient Arts. I'm looking forward to being able to do another one of these presentations down the road where I'll be able to show you all of our staff too. In the meantime, enjoy your knitting and your crochet and your weaving and your embroidery and everything else that you do.